Hi, welcome to my channel. In today's video, I want to discuss the principal construction and the working mechanism of a cyclotron. So what is a cyclotron? So the cyclotron is a specific kind of a particle accelerator that can accelerate charged particles to very, very high velocities so that those charged particles can then be used to bombard onto some target nucleus to induce some sort of a nuclear reaction or perform some kind of a nuclear experiment. The first ever cyclotron was developed by Lawrence and Livingston in 1929. Now, what is the principle on which this kind of a cyclotron is based upon? So if you have a charged particle that passes through an electric field, then it will get accelerated. However, if by some method, a singular charged particle can be made to travel through an electric field over and over again, repeatedly, then that charged particle can be made to accelerate many number of times, thus increasing its kinetic energy considerably. So in a cyclotron, a charged particle is basically made to pass through an electric field over and over again repeatedly in a very compact space by making it traverse in a circular or more precisely speaking, a spi spiral kind of a trajectory. But how does this happen? To understand, let's first look at the construction of a cyclotron. So this is a kind of a side view of a cyclotron and this is like a top view of a cyclotron. So what you have here basically is a cylinder. So this is a hollow metallic cylinder, which if let's suppose I take a cylinder and cut it along its diameter. So if you have a cylinder, and you cut it along its diameter, you basically separate the cylinder into two halves, creating a space along its diameter. So you basically have the semi-cylinder and the semi-cylinder, which is basically uh, separated by a small space, thus they are not touching each other. So here you have one half of the cylinder, which is known as D1, and the other half of the cylinder, which is known as D2. Two. They are separated by a little bit of a space and this entire setup is placed perpendicular to magnetic field lines which are generated by some sort of an electromagnet where N here is the north pole and S is the south pole. The purpose of the magnetic field line is to make sure that the charged particles inside the cylinder traverse a circular trajectory. Now you must know from your concepts of electrodynamics that whenever a charged particle is traveling perpendicular to a magnetic field, then it usually traverses a circular trajectory. So for example, if you have this plane of the blackboard that I basically have, and in this plane, a charged particle is traveling with a velocity vector v. All right. So if a charged particle is traveling on the plane of this blackboard with a velocity vector v, and if let's suppose magnetic field lines are protruding out of this board perpendicular to the plane of the board, right? So if magnetic field lines are protruding out of this board perpendicular to the plane of the board, in that case, the magnetic field B will be perpendicular to the velocity vector V. In such a case, the trajectory of the charged particle comes out to be a circular trajectory. Now, if you do not know why this is so, then I have created another video where I've discussed the different kinds of trajectories created by charged particles in the presence of electric and magnetic fields. You might want to check that one out. But if you are confident with this idea that a circular trajectory is exhibited by a charged particle whenever the velocity vector is perpendicular to the magnetic field line, then we can move ahead. So basically the force law which basically gives us the force experienced by a charged particle in the presence of a magnetic field is given by the Lorentz force law, which says that the force experienced by a charged particle Q is basically equal to its velocity vector V multiplied by the magnetic field line B. This is a cross product, all right. But in this case, the magnetic field line and the velocity vector are perpendicular. So it's a 90 degree angle. So this can be written as Q V B sine 90 degrees. So this can be simply written as Q V B. Now this is the force which creates this sort of a circular trajectory. So we can say that this force is basically re responsible for the centripetal force which keeps the particle in a circular motion. So we can say that Q V capital B, which is the Lorentz force, 
is basically responsible for the centripetal force mv square upon r that keeps the particle in circular motion. From here we can calculate different sort of physical quantities associated with this kind of a motion. For example, I can calculate the radius of this kind of a circular motion. Yes. So if v and v gets cancelled and I end up getting capital R is equal to mv upon q b. So this is the radius of any charged particle having a velocity v and mass m and charge q in the presence of a magnetic field b. So this is the radius of the circular trajectory. I can also uh, write this equation to look at the velocity. So the velocity, ve velocity is basically v is equal to q capital B r upon m. Right? This is basically the velocity. So from velocity I can find out the total amount of time period it requires for the charged particle to make one complete revolution. So the total amount of time period to make one complete revolution is nothing but the circumference 2 pi r divided by the velocity. Yes, time period for one complete revolution is a circumference divided by the velocity. So this is basically equal to 2 pi r divided by the velocity we have just now obtained q capital B r upon m r r gets cancelled you basically end up getting 2 pi m upon q b. So this is the time period. So if this is the time period I can easily calculate the frequency of this kind of a revolution. So the frequency of revolution is nothing but f is equal to 1 upon capital T which is nothing but the inverse of this which is q b upon 2 pi m. So this is the frequency of the revolution of this particle as it goes along in a circle. Now why have I obtained these physical quantities? Because as you will see, it will help us gain a little bit more perspective in understanding what is happening in the cyclotron. So this is the radius when it's a charged particle executes a circular trajectory. This is the velocity for the charged particle to have this sort of a radius. And this is the frequency with which the charged particle executes a revolution per unit time. Now let's come back to the cyclotron here. So how does the cyclotron accelerate the charged particle to such high velocities in the first place? So here you have the cylinder which is separated in the middle and the half, both these two halves are connected to the opposite polarities of an oscillating potential. Why an oscillating potential? Because if let's suppose at any given instant in time, uh, the first half the d1 is at a positive potential in that case the second half will be at a negative potential and therefore there is going to be an electric field line between these two d's in this space here right after some period of time when the polarity of the oscillating potential reverses this is going to become negative and this is going to become positive and the electric field line that exists between these two cylinders will basically be in this particular direction. All right. So at every point in space, there is going to be an electric field in this upward sort of a direction. So every time the polarity gets reversed, the electric field in this region also gets reversed in its direction. Now what happens because of this? Let's suppose that there is some sort of an ion source at the center here that emits some kind of an ion. Let's suppose a proton particle. All right. Now once the proton particle is emitted, the proton particle experiences the electric field in the upward direction, yes, and it gets accelerated in the upward direction. So as it gets accelerated, it basically enters, let's suppose D1. So as the charged particle enters D1 after experiencing some sort of an acceleration, let's suppose it enters D1 with a velocity of V1. Now what is interesting is that the moment the charged particle enters D1, now because inside this half of a cylinder, this D1, the potential is constant, yes, and because the potential is constant, the electric field is zero. The electric field is only non-zero in this space where there is a potential difference. But within the cylinder itself, where the potential is constant, the electric field is zero. And the same here also, within the cylinder itself, where the potential is constant, the electric field is zero. So as the charged particle enters D1, in that case, because the electric field is zero, it does not get accelerated anymore. It retains a constant velocity. Now, what happens because of this constant velocity, as we already discussed, there is a magnetic field line, which is 
going from north to south pole in this view but in this view the magnetic field lines are basically coming out of this board all right so there are magnetic field lines coming out perpendicular to the plane of this board so because of this this kind of a charged particle as it enters d1 will execute a semi circle you can say so it will execute a trajectory of a circle and then again it will come out of d1 now the moment it is about to come out of d1 let's suppose the polarity of this oscillating potential reverses so if the polarity of the oscillating potential reverses this becomes positive and this becomes negative now suddenly the electric field is also in this particular direction yes so electric field is now facing downwards so now this charged particle will get accelerated in this particular direction yes now because it will experience acceleration its velocity is going to increase and we can calculate what is the change in the velocity so change in the velocity can be just looked about from the uh, change in the kinetic energy so basically the potential can result in the change in kinetic energy which is equal to qv this is nothing but the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy yes so if let's suppose the particle had initial velocity v1 it will have a new velocity v2 where the change is half m v2 square minus half m v1 square so this can be written as 2 qv upon m is equal to v2 square minus v1 square or v2 is nothing but root over v1 square plus 2 qv upon m so basically if the initially the charged particle had v1 velocity here then the moment it experiences a potential difference of v its velocity increases to v2 where v2 is equal to root over v1 square plus 2 qv upon m so basically it increases by a certain amount now in d number one because of velocity v1 the charged particle had a radius r1 of m v1 upon q b right as it enters d2 its velocity increases and now because velocity increases to v2 now the radius corresponding to v2 is also greater yes so the radius corresponding to v2 is greater than the radius corresponding to v1 so the radius corresponding to v1 was this radius yes but now because of the acceleration the velocity has increased and the radius corresponding to v2 is of this basically radius so now it executes a circular trajectory but that has a radius greater than the earlier circular trajectory now again before it is about to exit d2 again let's suppose the polarity gets reversed so this becomes negative this becomes positive and the electric field also gets a reverse in direction so again it accelerates and then again it has a larger sort of a, a, a radius of a circle then again the polarity reverses right and again it gets accelerated and again it executes another larger sort of a semicircle then again the polarity gets reverses reverse again it accelerates again it experiences a larger semicircle so this process keeps on happening over and over again so that at every time the particle is about to exit any one of the d the polarity is reversed so that the particle only experiences an electric field pointing in the direction of its motion so that the particle gets accelerated and its velocity gets increased consecutively so if the velocity gets increased now, now the radius executed by its uh, trajectory will also be greater so the particle keeps on going with increasing semicircular radius so basically it keeps on going in this kind of a spiral sort of a trajectory with every step it goes on its velocity keeps on increasing so this is how the whole process keeps on happening inside the d the particle executes a semicircular motion as it is about to exit the d the polarity gets reversed so the electric field is now pointing in the direction of the charged particle so the charged particle gets accelerated its velocity increases and the corresponding radii of that circular trajectory increases so now again it executes another circular motion there is no acceleration within the d's because the potential is constant here and again as it is about to exit the polarity reverses it experiences an acceleration so every time the charged particle enters a region between these two d's it gets accelerated and then again it gets accelerated again it gets accelerated and again it gets accelerated over and over and over again so the charged particle as it goes in a circular motion with increasing radii so basically it's going in a spiral motion 
it keeps on increasing its velocity over and over and over again. This is how the cyclotron increases the velocity of a charged particle in a very compact sort of a space, thereby reaching very, very high values after many number of accelerations. Here I have calculated R1 and R2. But similarly, you can also calculate R3, R4, R5, R6. And here you, you can calculate V3, V4, V5, V6, where uh, at every step, the radius and the velocity keeps on increasing, thereby reaching a certain value that when it is about to exit, it has extremely high velocity. That means it has extremely high kinetic energy so that now this kind of a charged particle can be targeted to some sort of a target nucleus to perform some kind of a nuclear experiment. So this is the general working mechanism of a cyclotron that when a charged particle is placed in the presence of a magnetic field, it tries to move in a circle. In this case, it is placed also in the presence of two Ds which are connected to opposite uh, polarities of an oscillating potential so that every time it comes in between these two spaces, it gets accelerated. Now, one thing has to be clear that every time the charged particle is about to exit, the polarity gets reversed so that the electric field is always pointing in the direction of the charged particle. This can only happen if the frequency of oscillation uh, is basically equal to f here. So f is basically the frequency of revolution of the charged particle. As you can see, this is independent of the velocity. This is also independent of the radius. That means uh, at every single point, the frequency of revolution of the charged particle is this. It is independent of velocity and independent of radius. So if we can match the same frequency with the oscillating potential, so this is basically known as a resonance frequency. So if we can match the frequency with which the charged particle is making revolutions with the oscillating potential, then we can make sure that every time the charged particle is about to enter this empty space, then it will always experience positive electric field in the direction of its motion. So this is in general how a cyclotron works. However, it has a particular disadvantage that at extremely high velocities, it reaches relativistic speeds, then uh, the frequency changes. So for example, here I have the frequency which is given by F is equal to Q capital B upon 2 pi m, right? So the frequency here is basically Q capital B upon 2 pi m. Now, as you know, that at very, very high velocities, near about the velocities of the speed of light, there is a relativistic increase in the mass of the charged particle. So, if there is a relativistic increase, then I can write the increase in relativistic mass to be m naught root over 1 minus v square by c square. Now, because of this, what happens is that at very, very high velocities, the charged particle starts slowing down. So, as the charged particle starts slowing down, the resonance frequency of the the frequency of revolution of the charged particle does not match the frequency of the oscillating potential. So the charged particle starts lagging behind this kind of a potential and it does not get accelerated after a certain point in time. So therefore cyclotrons cannot work in relativistic speeds because in relativistic speeds we end up getting a frequency which changes as the particle reaches very high values and it, that frequency does not match the frequency of the oscillating potential because the cyclotron needs to work in that particular case only when the oscillating potential and the frequency of revolution are matched. So the cyclotron is a very common uh, uh, particle accelerator that can reach very, very high values, hundreds and hundreds of mega electron volts of energies for charged particles like protons. The only disadvantage is that uh, it cannot work in relativistic speeds. When cyclotrons are modified to work in relativistic speeds, those kind of particle accelerators are known as synchro cyclotron, which I'm going to talk about in some other video. So this is in a sense the principle, uh, the construction and the working mechanism of a cyclotron. So that's all for today. Uh, I'll see you in the next video.